And it's also not an overview of the unikernel space. I'm going to talk about the Rump Run unikernel exclusively and not compared to any other unikernels. Um, I just didn't have the time for that. Um, to make that properly, I comment on a couple of things. So let's start with the tail of an interface. Um, we can run things. That's all we do as programmers. So uh, how we do it is the other question that we ask ourselves all, all the time. So if we have this little program, it isn't even a hello world. So if I have the standard C main function, how do people run that stuff? On what and using what techniques? And that has changed a lot during the years. So just as a couple of options, uh, how can we run this? There has been a lot of evolution we can run this on bare hardware. That has been the case for some time, but it isn't the case since we're actually using operating systems to run these things on. So I can use a single user OS. People found out single user OS aren't very helpful and switched on to multi user OSs on top of that. Then they found out that if I run multiple programs on one machine, I might want to try that they don't run into each other's memory and try to read each other or even write each other's memory. So kernel started gaining the ability of having virtual memory spaces to separate programs. Um, I can go on with that. Uh, people started using those OSs and put virtual machines on top and run the programs in there, for example, the JVM. Or I could start virtualizing that. So I have a multi-user interface on a hypervisor, on a multi-user operating system, on their hardware. And that goes on. Um, I could use containers on one of those operating systems. Or even better, I could put those containers in a virtualized operating system and run that on an operating system on their hardware. That reads quite funny, but that's actually quite often the case nowadays. Um, spelled out, or in, in bronze, that would be a penguin on an ice fold serving pandas holding penguins that hold whales with containers on top that contain coffee cups full of beans in jars. <laughs> IT branding is pretty weird. Um, but that is, isn't all there for fun. Um, there are common goals in that. Um, some goals are better isolation for better security. That is definitely the case in containers and definitely the case with hypervisors. Uh, less or uniform dependencies for easier distribution. Docker is quite big in that. I want to have the dependencies for my app wrapped together, but not wrapped together with the dependencies of another app. Um, Runtime isolation for resource control. That is a thing where hypervisors are pretty big in. Um, I'm pretty well able to allocate resources, RAM, and CPU to any of the things they manage, and independence from lower layers. Um, but now that I had these many techniques layered on top, on top, on top, on top, on top, um, what if we rethought the whole thing and threw away a lot of these things? Um, there's one thing that is already trying that thing in the dependency space. That is, we are going to use static compilation a lot. If you use Go, you're using static compilation. If you're using Rust, you're going back to static compilation. So basically, I link the whole program in one. I don't do any library loading at runtime. I ship everything with my application. There are no moving parts. And the promise is zero dependencies. That's actually not the case, because you still have a kernel as a dynamic dependency. Um, so if you statically compile something for Linux, you still need to run it on a Linux machine and not on a Windows machine. Um, but what if we actually turn the kernel into a static dependency, treated it as a library, and say, we're just, running, we're just going to run this on some kind of computing machine. That still means we have the architecture as a dependency, so the whole thing just moves a little. Um, but we can do that. And that's the idea of unikernels. A unikernel is basically a minimal kernel built to support just the application that should run on top of it and only pro provides what the application needs. 
So if the application, for example, uses no disk at all, I just don't compile a disk driver. I just leave it out. If it uses no network, I just keep the network out. That also means that unikernels in general have no concept of a process. They're just, they're just there to call into your main function and be done with it. They have no concept of a user space. So there's no kernel space and there's no user space. Um, the idea behind that is if a process violates its, user, its memory space and goes into kernel space, the only thing it can find is things that are just there for the process itself. The kernel is really just supporting that one process. That also means there is no virtual memory, which can have issues. I will show that later. And it also means that they often even give, give up scheduling by themselves. So um, there's the possibility to use microkernels with uh, unikernels with schedulers that just um, give up scheduling by themselves and say, a hypervisor can do that for me much better because a hypervisor has knowledge of the world. I don't. So what can be removed is the question there. And there's a project by the NetBSD project, which is called the Rump Kernel. Um, the Rump Kernel is basically the NetBSD kernel available in pieces. It's part of the NetBSD tree. It holds all drivers and a couple of other things. And basically, for every piece of that component, you can say, I want that compiled in dynamically, monolithic. They even went as far as thinking about having kernel components networked. Uh, like attached over the network to the main kernel. Um, it's part of the main NetBSD project, and it has additional support to be run as a guest, especially on Zen and KVM. So it knows, it can be compiled in a mode where it knows about what Zen and KVM can do. So this is basically a picture on how that would look like. You have an application on top. Um, you have that so-called rump kernel base that always needs to be there, and every part of that kernel is a flag you can compile in or can compile out and keep it away. So you don't need Bluetooth, you don't need USB if you don't want to, and things like that. And then there's um, a so-called hypercall interface at the bottom that allows you, if you're running in a hypervisor, to inform the hypervisor of what you want to do. Um, so it allows interaction there. Although that's a thing that usually the kernel itself already provides the, inter the interaction with the hypervisor. As a user, you won't see that. Yeah, so the RUM kernel is part of NetBSD. And there's a project that came out of it which is called RUMP Run. And that is a POSIX compatible unikernel using all the POSIX libraries from NetBSD, standard libc, um, and standard POSIX interfaces based on that NetBSD RUM kernel. And that means they can often run POSIX applications on top of that thing with no changes. Deployment on hypervisors is standard, as I mentioned. So basically, any production deployment is recommended to be done on KVM or Xen. And EC2 builds are available if you want to. So I need a development environment for that. So this is definitely not a standard application environment. So what do I need to get started? I need a development environment. I need a runtime environment. The runtime environment is usually any kind of hypervisor you'd like to have. A standard here is QEMU, either in KVM, Xen, or standard emulation mode. And we're building a NetBSD system here. So you need a NetBSD cross-compile tool chain. And that sounds pretty awful. But it's actually quite easy. Um, I was very surprised. The NetBSD project ships a tool chain for compi compilation of the whole operating system and any kind of cross-compilation that runs on any modern operating system. If you have a C compiler available, you just go into the NetBSD source and tell it, I want to have the tools that can cross-compile to an x86 machine or one to an, to an i386 machine. Just wait for it to be done. Done. That's all you need. 
Um, it doesn't care about the host system. I have it running here on OS X and in a virtual machine on, uh, on Linux. Absolutely no problem. Um, it, they document that it also works on Windows, but I haven't tried out. And then there's two tools on top, which are called Rump Run and the Rump Run tools. So, and there's the same. You just tell it, you just clone the Rump Run repository, then you point it to one of the cross compilers you create it. That's the 3861 and the i4861 for 32-bit machines. And what you have to tell it is, should I compile the kernel for hardware mode, standard generic hardware, or with Xen support? Okay, in Xen support. Um, that maybe needs Xen installed because it needs the libraries, the headers, and things like that. And then the whole thing comes with its own tool chain, which is the cross compilers, which target the NetBSD, um, the NetBSD environments, a tool called Romp Bake to create kernel images that you can later run, um, the Romp Run project, a program that helps you starting virtual machines a little bit easier and with a bit of knowledge about how the Romp Run kernel works, and uh, CMake profiles for CMake based projects. So, here's a little demo, because so, I'm pretty open about that. I wrote down the commands. I'm not going to type that out here. So, um, if we have uh, a standard C program, hello world, um, this compiles quite fine. It's always recommendable to compile debug symbols, and yeah, it runs on my host system. Um, usually, getting that to run on the run kernel is as simple as just using the rump run provided compiler, which just creates a different kind of object file. It's an L64 bit um, standard executable that uh, NetBSD uses. And then I use the rump run bake application. What the bake application does is take the kernel, take your standard C program, and just link it together at the point where the main function is being called. That's all it does. Write it as an image that can be good, booted as a kernel, and um, that's it. And then you can use that. You can say rump run on QEMU. Um, this is just to make sure that QEMU does console output. Um, actually attach the serial console, interactive, and run it. There we go. This boots a machine that prints Hello World. Um, yeah, that's not a lot. Um, if it seems a little bit, if it seems a little bit slow, um, QEMO on OS X is actually fully emulated. So it fully simulates an x86 CPU. That's a lot faster if you go on Linux, where it can actually use the proper CPU. Um, it usually boots into the application in a couple of milliseconds. And that's basically all there is to the toolchain. to the building process. And the important thing is, there are no changes to the program, which is pretty trivial to, the, to that little piece of just printing Hello World, but that goes pretty far. Just to cover them, there's obviously additional run options for uh, Rump Run. It can configure network interfaces, command line arguments to the apl actual application. Um, it can uh, attach disk images, read-only and writable, and you can set environment variables. That's all you usually use in normal deployment, and you can do that here as well. There's a couple of platform configurations, though. Um, how do I debug? If you actually want to debug that thing while you're running it on a ROM kernel, um, GDB is all you have. Um, QEMO nicely allows you, 
um, to uh, run an embedded uh, GDB server. So you can go and have a look at that. Um, but that's the standard way of debugging that is being used and documented. And logging. So suddenly I am running something that has no disk, possibly no network and things like that. Um, so remote syslog and tracing the VM serial port is usually the thing. Any other logging framework that we use nowadays in, in uh, production usually assumes that they can run a process. No processes. Also, what if I want to have information about that system? I have no shell access because there's no shell. Um, there's a sub-project that is called RUM control. So the kernel exposes a control interface that has standard uh, Linux commands baked in, ifconfig, mkdir, things like that. So you can use that, but it's remote. You need to make sure that you have some kind of access to the kernel. So beyond Hello World, what can we run? There's another sub-project that's called Rob Run Packages that actually tries to build stuff on top of that, use standard software on top of that. And that's quite a lot, what's already working. So we have uh, there eight different programming languages, Erlang, PHP, Ruby, Node, uh, Rust, Go is a separate project. You won't find it in that repository. Um, C, C++, obviously, because that's the native language the stack works on, and Lua. Lua is, Lua is always first. <laughs> Full software, Nginx, MySQL, Redis, and HAProxy. They need minor patches because sometimes they don't know NetBSD. So usually it's like something where they rely on a Linux or FreeBSD feature. You need to make sure that you actually port them to NetBSD, but that's not a rump run problem. Um, Redis, for example, is a very nice example because Redis um, is a thing that needs none of the features that I told you, um, they are pretty happy with just getting a memory space and just working on that. That's their whole philosophy. And someone ported the whole round cube email stack. So if you want to use rump, uh, um, round cube on run, rump run, just go ahead, do it. <laughs> so what doesn't work? Any access to virtual memory doesn't work. And that's sometimes a problem for VMs. Um, if they want to do their own stack management, they often interact with virtual memory. Um, if anyone is experienced with that, the S break and break um, system calls don't work. Um, no process control at all, no fork, no exec. If any kind of software relies on that, um, it's not gonna run. And no dynamic linking at runtime. So anything that relies on um, loading shared objects later is also a problem. That is, for example, Varnish, because it needs DL open. Um, you <laughs> would need to port it over to having the configuration baked in. They do configuration over C shared objects. Postgres, MySQL can be used, but Postgres, for example, heavily uses worker processes. That's not possible to simply port. And I tried porting a couple of small talks, but uh, they all do weird things with virtual memory. So that's not a trivial thing to do. Most of the stuff compiles, except the memory management. And also, as I said, um, if you want to work on this, um, you should check what the scheduling strategy is that the kernel is currently using. So if you heavily rely on threads, and you're running on a ROM kernel that does cooperative scheduling, and does not interact with the hypervisor for, for other scheduling, you're in a world of pain. Anything that is evented and cooperative in scheduling is really, really nice here because they, are, they have less dependence on these kinds of things. So, I have a more complex application demo here, um, which a friend nicely provided. Um, that's a very, very simple server that basically just accepts a file upload, writes it to a disk, and that's all it does. Um, wrote it as a little experiment to um, work with um, web frameworks in Rust, actually. And there goes the same. I just tell, um, I just use the standard build tools. I just tell it the correct target, compile it. It's already compiled. Um, the project by itself might not be so big, but it has quite a lot of dependencies. 
especially towards sorry um, especially towards things like for example open SSL and other non trivial apis and that thing also worked with no porting work at all. Um, the only thing I did was implement a little bit of logging. And here goes the same thing. I just baked the binary on the kernel, and then I just used the rump run tooling to start it. Um, what it does here is it also forwards the internal port 8001 on which the application runs to 3000 on the outside, and um, it attaches a block device to make sure that I can put data somewhere. Um, the other thing it does um, is it actually has a, a little website statically built in. You can choose. This is a dissertation on the ROM kernel. Can upload it and will now tell me um, that it uploads, that it uploaded the data and wrote it to disk. Um, the double writing is, I think, a bug in the JavaScript. I think it double uploads. It's always JavaScript. And now for the important things. Um, we have here another one. Um, you can also run NetHack if you really want to. So if someone has, wants to run a 200 NetHack cluster, go ahead. <laughs> this is just running through the uh, VM serial port, but I think networking is up to you. So thanks, Leon, for the uploader. I didn't write it myself, but that's also like one of the things. If you don't write it yourself, it's always nice if you can use someone else's code and just compile it and it works. That's a nice way of validating. That's also the reason why I tried to port so many stuff, uh, stuff over to the ROM kernel, because if you know how it works, it's pretty simple to avoid all these problems. Um, but if they really want to say we're running a POSIX system here, you should try to get some POSIX software ported over. So what did we gain to an end? Um, we gained very strongly isolated applications that only depend on the hardware interface or the hypervisor interface. Um, so basically, the runtime dependencies are down to the hypervisor and the hardware. In hypervisor environments, we gain a very strictly enforceable resource control, and we have no runtime tooling dependencies at all. The nice thing is it's really use that image and run it, or use the data images along with it. And a couple of observations about these a little bit of travel. Um, first of all, how, how are things with the platform stability? The interesting thing about the Rump Run is that it's NetBSD at its core, which is a stable, proven, and developed operating system, so it's not some kind of new technology that um, will fail in weird ways. So the drivers and the kernel are actually stable. The boot times are fast. Um, debugging is possible using standard tools if you like GDB. <laughs> um, the tooling stability in itself is, generally, it's OK, um, but there's not too many users. So sometimes you run into a thing like that is, oh, no one ever tried that, or no one is using that path all too often. Um, there's not that many people, for example, using Rump Run on OS X. It runs, but if you have a problem, the people writing Rump Run are like, um, hmm. It should be a standard Unix, should it? But in general, it's surprisingly smooth. Um, and all those tooling issues are absolutely no problem at runtime. Um, it's surprisingly smooth, smooth, especially because at least like the cross-compiler tool chain is not a huge problem at all. So don't fear the cross-compiler. Um, fear QEMO. Um, the QEMO documentation is almost always correct, because just as no code is always correct, no documentation also has no bugs. Um, they generally tell you that there is a certain option. Then they tell you that it's deprecated and that you should use another one. And that's where the documentation basically ends. <laughs> um, yeah. Security. So 
um, all those properties that I sp spoke about in the beginning. Um, run prompt programs are as well isolated as your hypervisor is. Hypervisor exploits nowadays are not unheard of, but they're not as often as operating system exploits. And there's quite a lot of platforms that actually use hypervisors very successfully um, to isolate you from their kernel environment. Um, especially gaming consoles, for example, are using at least the hypervisor separation approach successfully for a couple of years. Um, dependencies, well, which we really ship all of them down to the kernel. It's all in that image. Um, if you want to run it in 10 years, if you have some emulation of that hardware, go ahead, run it again. You don't need to document which version of the kernel this actually is worked on. Resource control the same. You can use the hypervisor resource control, and hypervisors used to be all about resource control in a lot of fashions, so this is really far advanced. So the general technique here is let's delegate to tested software. A lot of the things the rump kernel just, or the rump run kernel just doesn't do. Um, it also means there's not necessarily infighting. For example, if I have virtual, a virtual memory system virtualized on top of a virtual memory system, I can run into a lot of problems there. If I have a scheduler running on top of a scheduler, and the rump kernel and rump run idea here is basically, okay, if I have a scheduler running on top of my system, why not just use that? And avoid layering. Don't fix all of these problems by introducing another layer, but actually let's start building down again. So that's the whole push in that unikernel space is basically all of that complexity, let's try removing something. And that's a thing I don't see that often, let's say. So what can we do with that? Just as a couple of ideas. Swarm deployments of small workloads, for example, possibly having untrusted code on top. So I could build something with the Node.js rump kernel, uh, rump run kernel. I could just <coughs> use, build something like AWS Lambda. Just run a bit of JavaScript. I don't need to play around with isolation a lot. It, there's just nothing else in that memory space, as long as my hypervisor is alive and running and has no bugs. Um, On-demand scheduling of, of workloads, these things boot really, really fast. It's um, hard to get in the, in the same time frames. Other things, for example, if, it, if I have a proxy, why, why do I run a proxy in a Docker and a virtual machine or something? But all it does is take a network connection and forward it. So why not use it for that? Um, a couple of issues is, um, can your infrastructure deliver images to the hosts fast enough? That's actually an issue on AWS. Most of the boot time is actually just making sure that there's a machine available somewhere. Um, does your cloud provider actually provide uh, virtual machines of the size that you want? Um, if I want to run a 64 megabyte Redis somewhere, <laughs> AWS doesn't provide. Uh, another problem with, with uh, many of those providers is they charge by the hour. If I want to boot up that thing for five seconds or for half a minute or something like that, I waste a lot of money. Um, and that's actually one of the biggest problems of run, trying these things out in the cloud. It just gets extremely costly even doing testing. Um, and all your images contain all your security issues, just the same as with static binaries. We just had it a few weeks ago. Um, the Go runtime had an exploit for, I think, weak hashing or something like that. That meant rebuild all your applications because you need the new runtime, and it's statically linked in. You can't just update it on disk. Um, I see unikernels a little bit in that push away from the shell. It's already the recommendation for Docker, for example, to actually don't ever shell into a Docker environment. So why do they even have one? So, um, and unikernels move towards, we have a network interface. You can interface with us in other means. And seen in another way, 
applications start to gain management interfaces. If the kernel and the application are unified, I could also say the network interface of the kernel is the network interface of the application. Then the next step on the push to static. And I think they are also the next step on the push to having immutable infrastructures down to I cannot even change the kernel below the application. So, um, but the question is, will it be romp run? I am absolutely not sure of if romp run will be the unikernel that we see and use in a couple of years, something like that. There's a couple of others, Mirage S and things like that. Um, romp kernel components will almost certainly be used though, because they are very well isolated from the rest of the NetBSD kernel. Um, available network drivers are always a hard problem in, in the Unix space, so a lot of the other projects already use parts of the ROMP kernel to build their little kernels. So um, I'm not sure if ROMP run will maybe stay the research project, the pretty advanced research project. Maybe it will also take off. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, and the other problem is that a Docker uh, so back, back to branding, we basically have solved the problem a little. A penguin on a nice full serving panda is carrying about prog programs on top. That whole sentence got a little bit shorter. But the problem is that Docker acquired Unikernel systems two weeks ago. And guess there will be advances in that as well. So if you really want to do a lot of further reading, I'm sorry that I forgot something. Um, there's a whole book about that thing to be read. It's a dissertation. Uh, it's called The Blue Book. Um, <laughs> you can read it for free and print it out. Um, but there's another edition to be written that actually cares about um, more of details of Rump Run and things like that. Uh, so if you really want to go into the details on how that all works, I can definitely recommend that. OK, that's it. Any questions? So I, I checked a bit with the packages provided, and I probably think you can use Gatling, like pure C um, stuff on Rump Run. Can you use any of the uh, virtual machines in production? Because like the PHP page says, uh, works with uh, fast GDI, but don't use it for production. Do you think any of it is like vital for production use? Mm, it depends. <laughs> um, PHP, I do actually have a little bit of an issue there because uh, a lot of what PHP relies on is you basically run it in multiple processes and... It's not a nice language, so I'm not defending yeah, it. Um, hmm. <laughs> The problem is that if you port like a whole runtime environment to an, to another platform that maybe has other scheduling behavior, you will find runtime bugs. I'm pretty sure about that, and that's why I would actually hold back on using just using Node.js from that um, from that repository and run it without having a close look and on how it actually behaves under my workload. Um, so what about like Nginx or HA proxy or stuff like that? Nginx and HA proxy, I don't have that many issues with because they don't ship a runtime. Um, and for example, for me, coming from a Rust environment, um, one of the big things that we like about Rust is that it doesn't have a runtime. So any kind of application you write on top of that that doesn't do runtime -y things by itself, basically just works as you write it. That's, that's basically the problem of all these VM machines of Ruby and, and these things is that the runtime itself is such a complex beast that so is porting it, it and checking it by yourself is a problem. So would it run faster than a full virtual host for Ember, whatever? Um, depending on what your program does. For example, virtual memory issues in virtual machines, like page faults tend to be extremely expensive in virtual machines. If you don't have virtual memory, you don't have page, page faults. So like if like you I will just use it for load balancing, it might work with SSL and all that stuff. Well, yeah. Um, SSL is an issue, yeah. 
Um, if you want to go towards, um, I run every SSL thing in a subprocess. Subprocess. <laughs> we don't have those. Yeah. A very interesting talk, and I love the idea about immutable infrastructure. Though I was wondering about configuration management from a testing perspective. Usually we build something, mm -hmm. configure it for testing, check it, and then configure the same thing for production and use it. Mm -hmm. So I think here you would have to bake the configuration into the binary, which mm -hmm. means you don't run what you test. Um, you don't need to bake the configuration into the binary. Um, you can pass, for example, um, command line options or environment variables, any kind of things, you can always mount a configuration image. For example, if you, if you run the Nginx sample, it just mounts the configuration as an image. And if you want to reconfigure it, you just mount a different configuration disk image. Who maintains the file system in those images? You, yourself. Use gen ISO image or whatever. Um, so this is actually one thing that um, the Rump Run packages examples do do quite a lot. They do um, image organization, um, library. Um, they make sure that libraries are built independently. So they do a little bit of configuration management, although on a very low level. Cool. So do you use a unikernel in production anywhere? No, no. As I said initially, this is basically a write down of a hobby project. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but there's one thing I have to say about OpenSSL. Um, why don't you run OpenSSL on a unikernel somewhere? Like, yeah. So that, that would be basically the approach of isolation. Like, why don't we just run another one? Um. Yeah. Um, what is the uh, major difference between uh, Rump Run and other unikernels, for example, Mirage? Well, uh, that's what I said initially. I didn't have, like, as it is a hobby project, I didn't have time for a very deep comparison between Mirage and Rump Run. So, sorry about that. Okay. Um, any experience running Rump Run on the bare metal? No. <laughs> um, we'd, we'd like to try that out on a Raspberry Pi at some point. Um, I'm wondering about your uh, your problems on uh, Docker, the Mirage, the the micro uh, unikernel systems that has been hmm? uh, taken over by Docker, uh, bought that is. Uh, horrible so, naming of the Docker infra of infrastructure. That that was all. Like having whales and Docker's and everything. It's like it will make the whole branding thing much more confusing. All right. Um, I think it's an interesting move by Docker. Um, because basically, currently unikernels aren't very widely used, so everyone who's actually having a company producing something is available for the cheap. So if they want to bet on the future, now is the time. <laughs> so I think it's a very good move by Docker, even if it doesn't pay off. If it pays off, they make sure that they have one of the most prominent people there. Thanks for that information. I didn't really get to my question yet, though. Yeah. Um, so, talking to Anil and Amir, the guys from uh, Unikernel Systems, mm -hmm. uh, they have the opinion that Docker might provide a very handy front end to, uh, like, using Unikernels as a back end for the Docker interface mm -hmm. would provide a lot of, uh, yeah, um, environment, and a lot of tooling for the Unikernel system. I mm -hmm. think that's what they are looking for. Do you think that's a good approach? I think so. I mean, that's, that's what Docker basically at its core is good at. Um, they are doing a lot of how do we ship things from A to B, like how do we ship things to a machine, how do we run it, how do we um, do that on a whole data center. That's basically the core value of Docker. I think Docker doesn't really care if it's a container in the end. And um, so I, I think that's, that's the idea and that's a pretty good move. Um, I would also be interested, for example, in having a packer interface that just packs me a unikernel for EC2, blah, blah, blah. Um, for example, the, like currently, if you want to run it on EC2, the whole I want to register that thing with EC2 and want to run it there is all up to you and it's not really supported, obviously. <laughs> so that's still a bit hacky. So more tooling 
would definitely be helpful. More deployment tooling, especially. All right. Um, thanks a lot. And um, I think it's lunchtime now.